I lost my grandmother in January of that year. Hmm. And within nine months, I lost my father. It made me, uh, it made me introspect. It made me slightly philosophical. And I think it fundamentally changed in many ways the person that I was as well. In my first meeting with Mr. Modi, I thought to myself that I'd be spending 10 minutes at most. Modi ji spent an hour and 15 minutes with me. And the bell didn't ring once. The time he spends with you is with you. And that is leadership to me. And as I said to you that I am not someone who's governed by this. I'm someone who's governed by this. For the BJP, it's country followed by party. For others, it's the converse. That's the difference. Why has this alliance all come together? It is not a fight for democracy. It's a fight for kursi. I'm very clear whether there is an India alliance or there is no India alliance. The BJP is very strongly rooted in Madhya Pradesh. Election does not start the day the model code of conduct comes into place. Uh, for me, an election starts the day you win an election. Why is Mr. Kamal Nath so confident of victory? When there is a yawning gap between what you perceive to be your reality versus what the reality on the ground is. That to you is a case in point with the Congress party. The fact that cities and airports that were wiped off the civil aviation map post-World War II today are thriving as airports. It is no longer a China plus one strategy. It is now an India strategy. Namaste Jai Hind, you're watching ANI Podcast with Smita Prakash. Thank you for watching or listening in to the show and writing in to tell us who you would like on the show. Today, we have the Civil Aviation Minister Jyotiraditya Sindhya. For those who are not familiar with Indian politics, here's a short primer. Jyotiraditya Sindhya is a recent entrant into the cabinet of Prime Minister Modi. That was in 2021. He jumped ship from the Congress party in 2020 after being in that party for almost two decades. Sindhya belongs to the erstwhile royal family of Gwalior. His father Madhavrao Sindhya was in the Congress party. His grandmother Vijay Rajay Sindhya was part of the Jansang, the precursor of the current BJP of which Jyotiraditya Sindhya is a cabinet minister. Thank you, Jyotiraditya Sindhya, for being here. I don't know how to refer to you because your fans, you know, they refer to you as Maharaji and they, there are so many minister, sir, no, no, sir. No. My name is Jyotiraditya, so whatever you'd what? like. If it's a little bit of a tongue twister, which it sometimes... No, which, why would it be? Sometimes is for really? a lot of people, yeah. What uh, do you get called? So either Jyotir or Aditya many huh. times. Uh, so, or you know, in the US, uh, because for them it was a real tongue twister, so they abbreviated it to the first letter, which is just J. J. Uh, so you're uh, not Joe. No, no, no. I certainly am not a Joe. You're not a Joe. I'm not a Joe. Um, yeah. So, so whatever you okay. like. All right. So, um, you know, uh, there are a bunch of questions which I want to ask you, but uh, I would, of course, begin with your portfolio. Um, you know, when when you joined the BJP and when you joined PM Modi's cabinet, it was like a given. I think most people thought that, yes, he is going to get civil aviation. Um, tell me, what is the uh, how did you feel when it was offered to you or did you ask for it? No, not at all. I have, uh, uh, first of all, I've never uh, put a preference for any portfolio throughout my uh, two decades of public service um, in any of the portfolios that I've held. Secondly, I do not think that uh, uh, it is your domain uh, to ask for one, uh, whether it may be your preference or not. Mm. It is whatever the leadership decides uh, is right for you, where the leadership in its opinion, feels mm. that you can do the best justice. Mm. Uh, and therefore, um, for me, it was, uh, first of all, a very exciting portfolio uh, to have for various reasons that we'll probably get into while, while we converse through this interview. Uh, but most importantly, it was also a, a very emotional one for me. Yeah. Uh, and the reason for that was that my father had held this portfolio um, uh, in the early 90s, 91 to 93. And um, uh, for me, it was also uh, a challenging portfolio because uh, whilst he had held it, he had 
uh, really opened up the skies uh, and he had deregulated this industry uh, and uh, under the prime minister's uh, vision and his uh, uh, very decisive thinking he was very clear in terms of how he wanted to see uh, this sector grow uh, and be most importantly democratized dem democratized and therefore for me it was uh, a, a great challenge when i when i found out that i had this portfolio for our overseas viewers here's a short primer about jyotiraditya sindhya's father madhavrao sindhya madhavrao sindhya was the civil aviation minister in the cabinet of prime minister narasimha rao in 1992 one of the indian airlines aircraft crashed though without any loss of life and sindhya promptly submitted his resignation which prime minister rao accepted with alacrity Madhavrao Sindhya died at the age of 56 in a plane crash in Uttar Pradesh. All eight people died in the crash. At that time he was being seen as the future prime minister candidate of the Congress party. Young Jyotiraditya Sindhya was symbolically anointed the head of the family after his father's death. Jyotiraditya's father was the son of the erstwhile ruler of the Gwalior royal family. Jyotiraditya's mother Madhavi Raje Sindhya is the great granddaughter of the former prime minister of Nepal and Maharaja of Kaski and Lamjung, Shamsher Bahadur Rana. So let's let's rewind uh, back to the time when your father passed away. What was it like at that moment because you were really young? um and uh, your father was seen as uh, you know a prime ministerial candidate even uh, in those years and people saw so much uh, potential in him and here you were this young person uh, he was he was an influential i mean every son is close to his father but for you he was more than just a father he was a hero of sorts tell me a little bit about that period in your life it's a it's a painful period um it's uh not a period that to be very candid with you i like revisiting too often hmm. um i had been away at uh, stanford for 2 years i was pursuing my mba um and my parents had just uh, come for my graduation may of 2001 and uh, whilst i was at stanford i had uh, participated in a uh, a business plan competition um and as it turns out uh, my colleague and i uh with our business plan we had won the competition uh and therefore we were pretty much set on the path of making uh that idea which was on a piece of paper um uh, into reality and it was very early years way beyond this uh, outsourcing mm. um business trend that had started in india um uh, i'm i'm talking about uh, 2001 almost 22 years ago and we were looking at uh, really the uh, high end uh, outsourcing uh, high end uh, high value outsourcing um so we were looking at the technology aspect of it and so i came back to india sometime in uh, early mid august of 2001 and we were looking for office space and hiring people and things like that and um within a month and a half of me coming back uh, and i was in bombay um this happened on the 30th of september and uh, it pretty much changed my life mm -hmm. um i then um, got into politics and ran for the first time for parliament in 2002 but you didn't have any political inclination till then like did you I have did, a conversation I, with your dad about about politics my father was uh, um okay so let me rewind i was uh, i was certainly involved in an unofficial capacity with him since uh, the age of 13 i first campaigned for him in 1984 so i was uh, all of 13 years old and i remember that campaign uh, very vividly Uh, and i campaigned for him in every election since except the last one mm. uh, which was in um, 99 i believe because i had just gone to stanford so i wasn't here um so i was very much involved uh, with the region with with uh, some of his projects and things like that but in a in a peripheral manner mm. uh, not in a direct manner 
um, I I did not have aspirations of of joining politics at that point of time. I was much more focused on setting up a business. Um, uh, but then fate at times, uh, Smita ji deals you some cards, and you you have to accept them and take on the challenge at that point of time. But if you ask me, twenty years down the road, uh, would I change uh, anything in in the way uh, uh, fate has 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 taken me down a different path? And my answer is unequivocally a no, because the um, joy that one gets from not necessarily politics and I create a distinction my father always did my grandmother always did create a distinction between politics and public service and mm. our call in this family is not for politics it is for public service uh, and I remember uh, him saying once uh, and I've always carried it with me ever since that our lakshy kabhi rajniti nahi honi chahiye our lakshy janaseva honi chahiye aur rajniti keval ek madhyam honi chahiye us lakshy ki purti karne ke liye and so has it been my calling for the last two decades of of public life and therefore if you see my resume or uh, my internal calling is that of a public servant mm -hmm. and not a politician you know um, when he passed away when your father passed away there was this very poignant ceremony where you were appointed uh, a kind of a titular head should i say or uh, of the family and here you were a very young person your aunts are there your mother is there and you have your aunts who are much older than you uh, who are blessing you on the other side of the you know i mean your father was in the congress they are in the bjp but at that moment there is something which is uniting you all uh, grief probably and uh, and at that time politics doesn't play what was what was going through your mind at that stage it's i would say it's a step beyond grief uh, smita ji because um i lost my grandmother in january of that year mm. and within 9 months i lost my father um and so suddenly two generations just left um so it's be it's beyond grief and it uh, at least for me it made me um uh, it made me introspect it made me slightly philosophical mm. and it changed a lot of my world views and it changed a lot of the views i had on life um what should be important as opposed to what we think is important um what is permanence and what is temporary um and i think it fundamentally changed in many ways the person that i was as well you're very young and you still had this stoic expression uh, there was no uh, you know there was no outpouring of grief uh, you were watching your mother so young uh, widowed I, at I, that I, stage i i think i think m more than that i think it was to be very candid i think it was it was just shock and also it was internalization and also the fact that you you've got to rise to the to the challenge and you've got to you're the man of the family now and you've you've got to be responsible hmm. so there's no time for grief and there's no time to wallow in yourself you are now responsible for others and others beyond your immediate family uh a lot of people that look to my father for leadership for resolution um and one feels responsible because at the end of the day for us the family is not the immediate family it mm. is it is the people of the region it is all of uh, gwalior chambal malwa all of that and therefore that that uh, level of responsibility also dawns on you uh, and it's not doesn't dawn on you while you have someone elder in the family uh, be it my father be it my grandmother mm. and suddenly when two generations are gone then uh, it has to dawn on you right you know people are uh, people talk about dynasty politics in a very pejorative manner but uh, i'm sure you have a different take on that because as you said uh, it's not politics uh, in your family wasn't seen as something for being for power but it was it was more than that it was or it is beyond that it was it's a connection there's a public service and uh, there's this larger goal of you know serving the community so 
could you tell me what your view is about that it's exactly that uh, smita ji if you uh, actually look back in history uh, this family's origins are uh, are uh, very basic hmm. uh, basic we come from a small little village uh, in uh, satara district uh, hmm. whose name is kaner khed uh, and 3 400 years ago my ancestor was the patil of that village and the patil pretty much means in today's terminology in maharashtra is like a sarpanch a headman hmm. and we rose sh- through short dint of hard work and perseverance uh in the maratha ranks first within uh, under chhatrapati shivaji and then so on and so forth until mahaji sindhya who really uh, brought about the, or turned into reality shivaji maharaj's dream of hindvi swaraj by capturing delhi the only hindu ruler to have done that that's your great great grandfather that's uh, five generations five, gen- five six gener- yeah. six generations ago okay um uh, he was injured in the battle of panipat his leg got cut off Yeah, in 1761 third battle of panipat uh, 14th of january makar sankranti 12 uh, members of my family's heads were cut off uh, he is the only one who survived with an amputated leg and in 10 years he raised an army and conquered delhi um, and pretty much established as i said shivaji maharaj's uh, dream and ever since that it's always been uh, the service for a greater cause for the, for the family and therefore that history uh where on the one sense brings a great sense of pride but along with that pride also brings a great sense of responsibility uh in how to conduct your life uh what your mission and what your goals should be um and and for me personally it, as i mentioned to you it's been not more about politics but more about development and so for me in my last 20 years every morning that i wake up and every night that i go to bed is the thought of what else can i do which is different and how can i do the things that i'm doing in a different way to be more productive mm. and how can i bring about change of life so that's really been my calling uh, whether it's been in the role of a member of parliament or whether it's been in the role of a minister uh, that doesn't matter to me but at the end of the day it's about performance and it's about delivery so uh, the transition from a corporate life which you were leading to politics was a natural one you're saying which uh, but was it natural to get into with you know go into the congress party or your grandmother was with the bjp your yes. aunts were with the bjp yes but at that point of time uh, i did take that call uh, and it was a conscious call i do not believe um, that any decision uh, in life on any individual is thrust on you mm. uh it must be and it should be uh a uh, a thought out decision and i did take that call um and i did serve uh, within that party for 17 years your grandmother was uh, was this mother figure uh for the jansang and the bjp then and your father carved out his own space in the congress party yeah. was there a choice for you or did you automatically feel that your ideology matched the congress i don't think that uh, those who say that there is never a choice actually have explored all choices mm-hmm. there always is a choice there's a choice for you in your life in terms of you, the way you mapped out your career mm. there's a choice for me there's always a choice okay and you do way uh every opportunity and every option that you have before you take a decision right uh you were seen as very close to the gandhi family uh there are people who've come on the podcast who say that uh among the few people they know those who left the congress and came to the bjp the those who uh were in the congress they said of the people who could just walk in and chat with the gandhi family your name comes up right up there you were very close to the uh, to the siblings rahul gandhi and priyanka gandhi but what happened where did where did the relationship See, sour uh, the, personal it's, and it's, political it's not the it's not the issue of a relationship souring it's the issue of an institution losing its moorings um every institution like every individual 
has to have certain mission values principles and goals every political party in india i believe certainly has its own but when an institution starts losing its way uh when an institution uh, loses track with the reality of india when an institution uh, no longer is able to mold itself so you have a, a group of vision values and morals but then that constantly has to be molded along with what is happening in the environment when that happens then the process of decay sets in on the other hand you have a, a leader who is not only inspiring but is very committed to the cause of public service committed to the cause of the idea of india uh, uh is unflinching in his resolve uh to cleanse the system uh is very uh focused on uh delivery and execution uh changing the perception of india within india itself and externally and therefore there's a great uh attraction and a magnetism that prime minister narendra modi in his persona exudes uh and then when you have this wide chasm between on the one hand an institution that's going in, unfortunately going into decay and is not willing to turn around and on the other hand you have a enigmatic personality then of course one is attracted towards that if your cause is public service if your cause is public service then you have to make sure that you are able to effect that goal and that mission of yours and so for me it was a combination of this factor and equally important what was happening in my state uh in 2018 we all thought that there was a track record that the bjp had but we thought we could do way much better and i was part of that the congress and, party at this time yeah. yeah and i was part of that enterprise hmm. um and we did form a government uh we produced tremendous results uh, in uh, in madhya pradesh and more specifically in my region uh 126 out of the 34 seats there um and then we formed a government the choice of who is going to lead that government like in every political party is with the leadership of that party and i had i had no grouse with that i have no grouse with it at all even to this day um and i myself said that i will give my unflinching support but over a period of time when you see all the purposes of the establishment of the government fall by the wayside and a complete system of rot and decay set in and corruption set in moving away from the ideals of development and progress and when you raise that and then you are uh put down and insulted then certainly the cause of staying with an institution that you have fervently worked for is not that f- the fervor is not there anymore and on the other side there's a magnetism and for me so therefore it was a no brainer when you uh, were made in charge of uttar pradesh western uttar pradesh if i'm not mistaken Correct. yeah in that election you could anybody who was there covering that election could see your heart was not there in that uh, campaign uh, you were there of course you were there uh, with uh, rahul gandhi wherever he was going and there were there are visuals which are clearly there where he's performing some uh, religious ceremony and you explaining to him right hand left hand what that means you know it was literally you were there everywhere with him but your heart was not there in that uh, there was one or one or two uh, election campaigns which we saw where you know public rallies your heart wasn't there it had already started i think uh, disassociating see, I, i'll tell you what happens when you um, my grandmother my father myself we have been people and demonstrated by actions that are that are governed and driven uh, driven not necessarily by our mind but by our heart uh, and i have always believed that your heart has to be in your job if your heart is not there then you're just doing something because you have to do it that process had already started um uh, and i don't want to delve too much in my past because my past is in my past uh i made a 
a very clean break. I was very upfront. I don't hold any grudges. I did not hold any grudges. And if you saw the letter that I wrote as well, yes, I thank the party for the uh, opportunities and the time that I got to serve through the party. Uh, I also thanked uh, from the bottom of my heart all the people that I served with. But it was time for me to move on. But you didn't take the plunge on your own. You you took people with you. You broke the party. You broke the government. The Operation Kamal was put into effect. I don't think there was a, there was any Operation Kamal or there was any operation at all. A new government came uh, into power. No? Sure, but at that point of time, when I decided that it's no longer going to work the way it is, again, people who are not necessarily only politically tied with me, but there was an emotional bond, decided mm. that they will also walk with me. Mm. Uh, and mind you, uh, and I'd like to make this very, very clear in this conversation with you, you have seen uh, many cases in the history of politics of India where uh, Smita Prakash ji has gone from X to Y and Jyotiraita Sindhya has gone from Y to sure. Z. Uh, but there are very few cases where this has happened within 15 months of a government being formed. It's generally always the case that people move four months before an election or six months before an election. Uh, 15 months after a government has been formed and that too after 15 years. And those uh, who left with me 25 of them, six of them were cabinet ministers in that government. And that just shows you the bankruptcy of that government. That let alone the fact that they could not hold on to their MLAs, they could not even hold on to their cabinet ministers. Which also shows the persecution that probably went on within that government. Hmm. Versus not only the public at large, because there were many promises that were made that were being... Uh, defied every single day that this government was in, in government in, uh, in Madhya Pradesh, but also people were being persecuted. And therefore, at some point of time, people also decided to call it quits. And all of them, mind you, went back to the people. So hmm. the old system where I would move from X to Y and nothing would happen to me doesn't stand good anymore. Because they had to I have to go back to the, to the arena of the people and get elected again. And out of, uh, we had 29 by-elections, of which 28 seats were with the Congress. So 28 seats lay with the Congress party. The Congress party could retain only nine of those seats. But those who came with you, out of that six have gone back to the Congress now. No one's gone back, not a single person. 22 came with you. and Not a single person has gone back. So the people who have gone back are... There have been people who've gone back and there have been people who've come from the Congress to the BJP. Yeah. It's been both ways. Uh, but again, I, that, that's why I'm so glad I made that point to you. The floating population. So where are we now? Yeah. We, we are 55 days away from an election. Hmm. So that is bound to happen. Okay. During election period, I think more than me, you have seen many more elections than I have. Right. And during an election period, there is always this Ayaram yeah. Gayaram policy. True. And again, let me on uh, this in this conversation with you say that I hold no grudges. If you believe that you have a have a better opportunity somewhere else, no longer with the BJP, and that is your decision, it is better for you to move on. Hmm. And I hold no grudges against those people. You may have no grudges, but obviously the Congress has grudges because. Well, I can't help that. <laughs> 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 because they feel, you know, like with uh, Himanta uh, Sharma, they, there's this feeling that uh, it wasn't just one person going. You broke the party, you broke a system, and you set up another. And therefore, See, the, there's what, the thing I, that I, you I, could be. A, no, I mean, I'll, I don't want to use the I'll, word traitor, I'll, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, Smita ji, you run an organization, okay? If a sizable number of people are leaving from your organization. Should it be something that worries you or not? Yes. Is it something that worries the Congress? Apparently does, no? Because in Parliament, they lashed out at you recently. That's their prerogative. Hmm. And I, again, I hold no grudges for them to do that. Uh, but I don't think it does. 
And that's one of the issues. Any organization that is losing talent, at the end of the day, what, is, what defines a successful institution today in the world? Whether it's the media, whether it's a political organization, whether it's a corporate company. One single factor alone, and that is its HR. Human resource capability to be able to attract, retain, and make sure your talent is committed to you hmm. is the single biggest challenge facing any organization today in the world. And those that are successful versus those who are not, that is the distinction between those. So what is it that is working for the BJP as far as HR is concerned? I think the BJP believes in meritocracy. Hmm. The BJP believes in a, a democratic system where if you agree or disagree, you can speak up and voice your opinion. Uh, the BJP believes in credibility. And I think from the prime minister to the home minister to the party president, all the way down the garda. I think, and the democratization of the system. Today, if you're a minister in the central government, you're a member of parliament, you're an MLA, you're no bigger or no smaller than the ordinary BJP worker. You are first a karikarta. You are then anything else. And everything that is expected from a karikarta is expected from you. How did you take to that? Uh, because you I loved not it. Because I have come from a corporate background. Hmm. I started at the shop floor when I became a banker. Tell us about that. I... Uh, graduated from Harvard in 93 and I joined uh, investment banking uh, soon after. Hmm. And I was uh, first in New York and then Hong Kong and then came up and came back to Bombay and uh, along with my boss set up uh, the investment banking, Morgan Stanley Investment Banking office in, in Bombay. And it was the most enriching, rewarding experience. The, the other thing, along with HR, I think it's very important for any organization to continually be a learning organization. Hmm. I don't think you can incentivize people by purely paying them a fat check, but you incentivize people by ensuring that they're always learning while they're on the job. And my learning curve was almost 85 degrees while, while I was in, in banking because the exposure that I got, we started our investment banking office from our hotel room. So in Bombay. When, I, when I say that I was on the shop floor, we were on the shop floor. I was doing photocopying. I was uh, preparing PowerPoint uh, presentations for clients. I was doing the two binder punch, hole punching and putting it into files, taking our, our, I'm saying our because I spent 17 years of my life in Mumbai. Uh, our, our favorite black and yellow cabs in the monsoon rain in Mumbai. It's pouring, taking our blue binders, which we used to call our presentations, putting that as an umbrella so on our heads. So much for people saying that you're a privileged background yeah. kid. And, <laughs> and running from one office to the other and making pitches. Uh, it, it was an amazing learning experience. Mm -hmm. And so I did that for almost uh, five years um, before taking a year off and then finally deciding to go to business school. So you've gone through the mill in learning how to do it. Uh, you bring that discipline into the party when you come. Now here, you, but you can't disassociate from the privileged background that you have. Uh, and you say I that... I wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want to. I, I wouldn't want to call it a privileged background. It's a background that I'm extremely proud of. Hmm. Uh, it's a background that is steeped in uh, hard work, uh, perseverance, commitment... Uh, ideals and a vision. But you come to the floor level when you start, isn't it, as a karyakarta? You begin with uh, learning a new kind of uh, and, 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 and I working think, style, and I think ethics. The, the ability to be able to adapt is key. Okay. Uh, never ever in life, and, and this is something that I've learned both from my mm. grandmother and my father, mm. uh, must you think that uh, there is no learning left. Mm. You must always try and see what is it that you can better about yourself? What is it that you can correct about yourself? Always be open 
to constructive criticism, uh, see how you can change uh, the way that you uh, uh, evolve so that you can be a better human being. You've been in Delhi for so long uh, in various capacities as minister, you've been in parliament, but state politics is extremely important to you, isn't it? Uh, and now yeah. Madhya Pradesh is going to polls. I'd recently interviewed the chief minister and I had asked him this also because uh, in Madhya Pradesh, there's this whole talk that there is a, a Shivraj, there's a Naraz and there's a Maharaj. So uh, there are factions within the BJP where everybody's sulking. There what are, do you have to say to that? There are no... There there are a first of all there are no factions and this terminology has been put forward by those uh, who believe in a jhoot loot and and suit ki sarkar uh, suit ki sarkar yeah they believe in corporatism they believe in milking money out of the system um and that's what they showed in their 15 months. Imagine this, that if we had had that government through COVID, where there was no management, there was no care about preparing for COVID. If we had had that government today, a Madhya Pradesh that was a Bimaru state in 2003, when the BJP took over, across all uh, levels of index, uh, in terms of development was a complete failure. Today, that very state from an irrigation potential point of view has increased its potential seven times from seven and a half lakh hectares to 47 lakh hectares. Power production, we used to hear about bijli nahi hai, lattu mein uh, prakash nahi hai. From 5,600 megawatts to 28,000 megawatts. Pothole roads, you couldn't drive in Madhya Pradesh and I'm sure you'd experience that as well. Yeah. 44,000 kilometers of roads, today 5 lakh, square, 5 lakh kilometers of roads, almost 12 times. GDP, 11,000 rupees per capita, today 1 lakh 40,000 rupees, 1 lakh 40,000 rupees per capita. Doctors in Madhya Pradesh, 7,500, today 51,000. Across all parameters of development, Madhya Pradesh has transformed itself under the leadership of the BJP, under Shivraj Singh Chauhan. If you did not have the BJP today, you would not have the development schemes which they had all scrapped. What did they promise? They said, Congress ka kehna saaf, har kisan ka karza maaf. And Congress, no one less than the Congress president himself, Rahul Gandhi, from every podium, said, agar dust din ke andar humne kisano ka karza maaf nahi kiya, hum mukhya mantri ko badal denge. The public waited for 10 days, for 6 months, for 15 months. Not a single Kisan ka karza maaf hua. 26 lakh Farzi certificates were distributed. Shivraj Singh Chauhan, as soon as he came into government, the biyaj of every Kisan, 2,300 crores, he put the money directly into the cooperatives. Today, you have a Kisan Samman Nidhi that is run by Prime Minister Modi, where 6,000 rupees is given to every marginal farmer's bank account. 11 crore farmers across the country. To that, the BJP state government has added an additional 6,000 rupees. That means close to about uh, 84 lakh farmers have been added onto that scheme. So 12,000 rupees as opposed to 6,000. Lardi Behnam Yojana, 1,000 rupees of empowerment per woman is going into people's accounts today. It is not something that we are promising. It's been happening since June. 1 crore 31 lakh women in our, in our state. Infrastructure development, my area, Gwalior today, I'm building out a 600 crore airport in Gwalior. Prime Minister has approved a 500 crore railway station in Gwalior. An elevated road, Gatkari Sahib has approved like the ring road in Delhi, 1400 crores. A water scheme connecting Chambal to Gwalior, which has been the dream of Gwalior, 1200 crores has been approved. Would this development have happened under a Congress regime? Are the people buying this argument because that, the polls show that, that that the the belief that this will be made possible the testament to that is the result that you got in the by-elections where out of 28 seats held by the congress the congress lost 19 which means that you had some level of trust and belief that the bjp and its leadership 
would result in development and progress for this region which had been ignored hmm. in the last 15 months and i am confident today that in this election in november you will see a very strong reemergence of a bjp government in madhya pradesh there are people uh, who feel that you know uh, shivraj ji has been cm for so long the youth they don't even know what it is like the young the young voters the first time voters they were probably five or six when he became uh, chief minister and he's been around so many people who we spoke to said boriyat ho gayi hai if nothing else it is that that you know that we want to change for no other reason that we've had shivraj ji for a long time you want to change does that mean that they would want to change even in the bjp or just the chief minister No, I don't think that. So, so you have two kinds of situations when you go into an election. You either have an anti-incumbency, and the best example of an anti-incumbency is what happened in two thousand and three to the Congress Party, where uh, the Congress Party was reduced to thirty-seven seats out of two hundred and thirty. That for you is anti-incumbency. Uh, or you have, uh, uh, in the case. of many governments a re-election back into government i certainly believe that in madhya pradesh it is the f- the latter and not the former mm-hmm. uh i have toured uh, almost about 22 districts of madhya pradesh uh and i do not see forget about anti incumbency i see a pro incumbency our schemes have resulted in uh actually economic development of people across all strata forget about caste forget about religion uh, across all strata and because of that i see that there is tremendous belief in the bjp uh the congress has had a track record in madhya pradesh you're absolutely right uh if in the event it had not had a 15 month government but people have tried and tested that 15 month government and seen exactly the yawning gap between the promises made and the delivery and therefore and 15 months mind you is a very very long time for government to give you my own example i have been a minister now for just a little over 2 years 15 months is a very very long time for you to be able to perform and if you had performed and if smita prakash ji had left you certainly in the by election should have held on to the seats that were yours Hmm. prior to uh, prior to smita prakash ji leaving the fact that you could not hold on to your cabinet ministers you could not hold on to your own mlas how many mlas 114 mlas you could not even hold on to 25 of them and let me tell you on record here that there was rancor widespread many more beyond the 25 mhm then why is mr kamal nath so confident of victory everyone is confident everyone exudes confidence hmm i have told you this many a times smita ji that when there is a yawning gap between what you perceive to be your reality versus what the reality on the ground is that to you is a case in point with the congress party see but rahul gandhi recently said he he showed confidence about madhya pradesh he said chatisgarh and madhya pradesh is in the bag uh, rajasthan will be kind of a fight he he wasn't saying that we're going to win all four states all five states i'm not polls. going to get into a debate over, over what x says or y says i am only saying to you from my side that i have a full 100% confidence that the bjp will form the next government in madhya pradesh why do you think kamal nath ji doesn't want the india alliance india alliance to campaign or to hold rallies he like i don't need them i we are fine with ourselves you, he's that confident you should ask him that he seems see the 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 alliance is just about in its nascent stage what is your view about it that do you think any ripples at all in your state from my point of view i am very clear whether there is an india alliance or there is no india alliance the bjp is very strongly rooted in madhya pradesh it is rooted in every panchayat it is rooted in every ward couple that with the fact that development has reached every panchayat mm. development has reached every ward 
there is tremendous amount of belief in the party there is tremendous amount of belief in the leadership of the party both in the center and in the state and i am very confident that the people of my country and the people of madhya pradesh both are extremely astute when they cast their franchise and they will cast their franchise for what will do good for them in so, their perception uh, and as far as the alliance. indi alliance or the india alliance this is exactly the internal uh quagmire if you will hmm. that this alliance is is faced with it is doomed from the day it starts karu ya na karu saath rahe ya na rahe whereas they say that it's it's the bjp which is nervous that's why this whole bharat india thing why has this alliance all come together it is not a fight for democracy it is not a fight for development it is not a fight for bharat jodo it's a fight for kursi and you think the people of india don't see through that where on the one hand you have a towering personality of a man that is devoted to maa bharati every step that he takes every single minute of every single day a person who works 22 hours a day for india for bharat today is being conspired against by this indi alliance just because for some way or the other they have been away from the kursi for too long and they want it why it is not to serve india it is not to serve their state it's it to, to save it's to the serve idea, themselves it not to save the idea it is to serve it india? is to serve themselves to save the idea of india the unity of india what is their idea of india hmm. their idea of india is to oppose article 370 i was in that congress working committee where the abrogation of article 370 was being attacked and i raised my voice even though i was in the congress working committee as a member of the congress working committee and i said that this is the idea of india that we are attacking there is no way we should do this and i was attacked and i am talking about what roughly about 10 months before i left the party what did they say to you I don't want to get into that. That's my past. Okay. But sure. Let me just say this: they did not spare me. <laughs> so that's fine, and that and that's fine. I, I we can have a difference of views, and I respect that. I even tweeted on that. Hmm. Their idea of India is to oppose the Ram Mandir. Their idea of India is to go outside India and attack India. Their idea of India is anything that is constructive. for india must be decried that is their idea of india there have been many governments in the past smita ji and let's go back in history where you and i may be i don't want to use the word foes but um opponents hmm. politically hmm. but when the idea of the country comes in mind we have worked together atal bihari vajpay ji is an example of that yeah country always must come first for the bjp it's country followed by party for others it's the converse that's the difference and therefore this fight is not for india it is for their existence um in your interaction with uh, mr modi when you first met him after you joined the party did you uh, firstly who approached you to join the bjp one if you can uh, tell me that if you can't i will understand but when you had your first meeting with him what was that like well let me say this that um i i, I don't want to get into my past as i mentioned but uh i had met with mr modi even on the sidelines of parliament uh, uh while i was in parliament uh on the congress side and i always had uh, a respect for him in terms of uh, uh his commitment towards development progress the country and uh my first meeting with with him was a very very warm meeting a very warm meeting um i don't want to get into the details but mm. enough said but is that is there something that he said to you what he expected of you when he was giving you the portfolio 
of civil aviation was there any goal set for you yes in my first meeting when i uh, when i went to meet with him hmm. i first went uh, thinking a meeting with the prime minister someone who's uh, an extremely busy person uh and i had thought to myself that i'd be spending 10 minutes at most Modi ji spent an hour and 15 minutes with me and uh we had a very free ranging conversation not limited to politics not limited to the portfolio and it just amazed me that a person who is so busy so i don't want to use the word burdened but so so many responsibilities on his shoulder the time he spends with you is with you hmm. that in itself gets you completely committed to that person and the bell didn't ring once yeah that's what i was going to ask you the he's not checking his messages files nothing completely devoted to the person that he's conversing with hmm. and that is leadership to me that is commitment to me and as i said to you that i am not someone who's governed by this i'm someone who's governed by this hmm i'm going to come to uh, one thing that i've seen uh, many times you you go to temples um you are very spiritual it's quite clear that it's not the ritual itself you you're totally committed to hinduism um what is how do you feel about this attacks on uh, sanatan dharma and it being called all kinds of names it's disgusting hmm. it's disgusting I, I, something that is the foundation of our existence faith in india is cannot be separated from our existence it is an integral part of our dna that faith has over centuries and thousands of years spread the notion of what the prime minister talks about today and i was amazed when he coined the G20 presidency in that format vasudeva kutumbakam one world one family one earth that in essence is the bedrock of our faith hmm. and if someone doesn't decry that someone wants to destroy that that to me is evidence of someone who wants to destroy our civilization and the essence of our civilization and this alliance that you talk about look at the opportunism the people who want to talk about bharat jodo are silent on this hmm. not a single comment you went to st stephen's stanford harvard these are all uh, liberal arts places there are the uh, you know it's not uh, it's not even centrist there is more a left liberal lobby which is working there there seems to be this whole uh, anti bjp uh, and anti modi especially uh, narrative which has stemmed from those universities and the media and the ecosystem there now so and that's becoming louder and more assertive Uh, see when you are um in an echo chamber like this one mm, not an echo chamber uh, <laughs> i'm kidding yeah um so when you're in an echo chamber and when you are uh unfortunately not exposed to what the reality on the ground is mm. then you may come up with certain notions mm. notions that are not based on fact right and therefore and when you realize that the reality is different then those notions do get dispelled now in as much as there is this lobby that you talk about there is a far greater lobby that believes in the leadership of prime minister modi in the world there's a far greater lobby that is looking to him no longer for leadership in india no longer for leadership in the global south but looking to him for leadership on a worldwide basis 
And the G20, whether it was in Bali or whether it was the G20 in India, is clear evidence of that. Mm -hmm. COVID is clear evidence of that. Name me one country that was never on the technology curve that has in a time of human calamity produced two vaccines and not only produced two vaccines but with a 140 crore population looked at not only inoculating its own population but through vaccine maitri inoculating people in 100 countries across the world everyone was raising their walls and, and again rightfully so yeah, i'm not yeah. i'm not grudging any country for doing so sure. right and you had in india that lowered all her walls and in fact in a time of need also reached out to the world hmm. now why did that happen leadership of pm modi operation ganga 25000 of our students in ukraine we sent our planes out 90 sorties were carried out by our civil aircraft almost about 60 sorties by the IAF. We did not bring back only Indian citizens. Yeah, Bangladesh and We brought Nepal, back citizens from across the world. Afghanistan, yes. Across the world. Yeah. Did any other country, and there were other citizens also stuck in Ukraine, did any other country, and I don't want to name any country, but did any other country send even a single plane? Mm -hmm. We opened up what were domestic airports in... Uh, in um, the neighboring countries to facilitate those to, students to facilitate no 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 to facilitate our international aircraft coming in okay and i have to thank the leadership of those countries and that has only been possible due to pm modi right so today the world is also looking towards him and through him through to india never ever before has the world occupied the center stage of international Politics plus business. It is no longer a China plus one strategy. It is now an India strategy. Interesting. Never could you or I ever dream that Airbus would set up a manufacturing facility in India. Today we've ordered 56 aircraft. 16 are coming from their facility in Spain. 40 are going to be produced in Vadodara in a joint mm. venture with Tata's. Never could you or I ever think that our Chandrayaan would get supplanted on the south pole of the, of the moon. So, to use something that we've grown up watching on TV, but to use that cliched euphemism, if you will, India's going where it has never gone before. Star Wars. Of course you'd say that. Okay, let me come to your portfolio now that uh, we've talked about airports. 74 airports in seven years. Uh, minister, we're going to run this tweet of uh, the former finance minister, Mr. Chidambaram, who lashed out uh, at your party and your claims and calling them fake and hollow. So here's the tweet. The claims of the government that they built 74 airports in the last seven years are hollow and untrue. Only 11 new airports were built since 2014, which are operational. The 74 airports include nine helicopter stations and two water drones. The water drones closed down after the inauguration. Out of the 74 airports, 15 are no longer in use because there are no flights. The BJP NDA government launched 479 new routes. Quote, Out of these... 225 are no longer in operation. Each scheme of the government can be exposed as partly true and mostly false. Boast and exaggeration are the hallmarks of the present government. What do you have to say to that? I know you clarified, Mr. Rijuju also said after See, that. See, there are some people, as I mentioned in our con earlier in our conversation, there are some people who, having been in opposition for close to 10 years, believe that they must always wear the opposition hat even to the detriment of our country. Why? Because I'm in opposition. Even if there's something good happening, I've got to pull it down. Hindi mein kahawat hai ki kai aise log hote hain jo apni lakir lambi khichne ke bajaye mein dusri ki lakir ko mitane mein lagte hain. Aur ye usi ka udharan hai. Those who in their tenure could only build 74 airports in 67 years 
Prime Minister Modi has built 75 airports, water drones and heliports in nine and a half years. And let me commit to you today that this is not where we're going to stop. By the year 2028, 2029, we will cross 200. Civil aviation is going through a explosive growth period that it probably has never seen through the history of our country. And civil aviation, let me tell you, is a very old enterprise in our country. It's not a mm. recent phenomena. Civil aviation was there in our country prior to independence. Air India was uh, started prior to independence. 2014, we had 6 crore passengers, domestic passengers in our country. Today, nine and a half years later, we have 14 and a half crore passengers. By 2030 to 32, that number is going to grow from 14 and a half today to 42 and a half crore passengers. That's the kind of growth that you're looking at in hmm. India. 3x from where we are today. Hmm. Okay. If you look at the number of airports, 74 in 2014, 149 today. And that is going to grow to above 200 by the year 2030. If you look at your fleet size, we were 400 in 2014. We are above 700 today. That's going to grow to about 1200 to 1500 by 2030. So civil aviation, if you now the next question that you should ask me is why, how? And the one change that Prime Minister Modi has brought about in the area of civil aviation is that he has truly democratized civil aviation. Ure Desh Ka Aam Nagrik, the scheme. Udan, yes. Udan. The fact that cities and airports that were wiped off the civil aviation map post-World War II. Okay. That again, prior to independence. Today are thriving as airports. Jharsu Guda in Urissa. Rupsi in Assam, Kishangarh near Ajmer in Rajasthan, Darbanga. These are airports, this is just examples for you, that are generating between 100,000 to 500,000 passengers per year. Hmm. There was no connectivity. And that is only going to continue. So the important thing for me that I'm concentrating on is not only my six metros, but I need to make a hub and spoke system so that I can carry passengers from tier 3 cities to tier 2 to tier 1, connecting them across the length of breadth of India and then internationally. What about affordability? Will it be affordable? I mean, yes, uh, it, so, you are building... So, so my, my sector, hmm. the civil aviation sector, is a highly price elastic sector. Unlike what you and I think when we are on the outside. Price goes up by 5%, demand drops off by 20%. It's a highly price elastic sector. Now, what happened in June, and I think that's what you're referring to. Mm, the gouging, yeah. So what happened in June is two things, Smitaji. One, please understand that this sector is a cyclical sector mm. on an annual basis. Mm. So you have periods of high season mm. and then you have periods of low season. Mm. So for example, starting the Sera, in October, your high season takes off all the way through Christmas, New Year, up till end of Jan. Hmm. And then you have low season from February until April, May, when kids' schools yeah. go into vacation. And then May, the high season starts again till the onset of monsoon. Then from July to September again is low season. So you have crests and troughs throughout the season. And as you have crests and troughs, you also have variability in fair pricing. And that's not something that's limited to India. It's a international um, uh, occurrence that happens. So A, we were in high season in June. Second, unfortunately, one of our airlines due to contractual issues and having their own problems with their OEM supplier, shut shop. Shut, shut shop. So we had suddenly close to about 30 aircraft in a fleet of 700 that were no longer flying. So you had a double whammy. You had a seasonal effect where there was high demand. And then on the supply side, you had close to about a 5 to 7% fall in terms of aircraft. And that created that, that environment. 
But even in that environment, you had select cities that were applied to buy go mm. first that actually had this huge walloping rise in FA. So, Srinagar, Ahmedabad, Leh, Pune, uh, five or six cities. I immediately called a meeting of the airlines on the 5th of June, if I recall correctly. Um, and I very clearly explained to them. I did all the analysis. I showed them how fares were going up. And within 10 days of that meeting, fares had come down to lower levels than what were, what were hmm. occurring prior to June. Hmm. You know, uh, uh, there's this talk that India needs a new civil aviation policy. Are you, uh, do you agree with I that? Don't, I don't agree with that. Our civil aviation policy is promulgated in 2016. Hmm. It's a very robust policy. Um, uh, I, I do not think, I think our policy front is uh, very clear, uh, very robust. In fact, uh, uh, after I took over, I changed a number of the policies. I changed the MRO policy, I changed the flying training organization policy. We took the drone policy drone. back to yeah. uh, back to the drawing board and completely scrapped the 72 permissions and the 25 fees forms that we had to pay and made it extremely simple. So from a policy perspective, I believe that civil aviation has evolved tremendously. Mm. Uh, sure, there are always uh, areas where we need to uh, uh, improve. Uh, but I think a lot of digitization has taken place. We've taken uh, BCAS digital. So we've got now eBCAS, so all your permissions, all of that is online. We've taken uh, DGCA digital. We've got now EGCA. So 298 services of DGCA are now online. So the human uh, uh, front and the going and submitting of forms and all of that is all today history. Uh, what is extremely important is to ensure that along with huge growth, public sector and private sector, we have close to about a one crore pipeline over the next, uh, 1, 000, one lakh crore pipeline over the next three to four years in terms of uh, airport uh, expansion. Uh, private sector is about 60,000 crores off that and uh, AI is another 25, 30,000 crores hmm. uh, where uh, AI is... Uh, uh, looking at 42 brownfield projects and three greenfield projects of which we built Holongi already. And the private sector is looking at five brownfield and, and three greenfield, Jaywar, Navi Mumbai, uh, and uh, 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 the airport near uh, Vishakhapatnam. Uh, so we have a very expansive policy, but it's also important to increase the institutional structure. Mm -hmm. And that's something that had not been looked at for a while. So, uh, our airport's uh, uh, economic regulatory authority, we've uh, increased their uh, bandwidth from five, st five uh, personnel to 10. DGCA, we've increased by uh, close to about 416 personnel. ATCOs, your air traffic controllers within Airports Authority of India. In 2019, we had roughly about 2,796 ATCOs. Uh, we've increased that to 3,700. And now, f thanks to... Uh, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharamanji, we've got an additional 385 ATCOs sanctioned uh, to increase that bench strength. Because as the number of airports increase in India, as the number of watch hours increase in India, we need to have greater number, number of air traffic controllers as well. So the institutional setup has increased. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at now today setting up the uh, ecosystem of uh, civil aviation in the country. Civil aviation is unlike what you and I what think. What is the ecosystem of civil aviation? Yes, so unlike what you and I think is not only about airports and airplanes. You need to have the whole uh, footprint of civil aviation place. What does that mean? We need to talk about MROs, maintenance, repair and overall, mm. so that the engines uh, are adequately serviced. We've got a number of MRO players who've come in after the new MRO policy. Safran, the largest engine maker, uh, has committed $150 million to set up a leap engine facility in India, servicing to start with about 100 engines and ending up at roughly 500 or 1,000 engines. Uh, we've redone the FTO policy because we need many more pilots in our country. Uh, so from 35 flying training organizations, we're going to end up at uh, 50 flying training organizations by the end of this fiscal year. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got the first helicopter training organization, not in India, but in Asia, that was set up two months ago in Khajurao. Uh, we've trained, uh, we've issued the highest number of CPLs, commercial pilot licenses, in India's history, almost close to about 1,200 uh, in this last financial year. And we hope to increase that going forward. 
uh, along with MRO and FTO, uh, also uh, looking at the uh, area of uh, aerospace manufacturing. Because as this ecosystem comes into place, we must supplant the, the capability of manufacturing in India. Uh, and though Boeing and Airbus are already in India, Airbus exports close to about $650 million worth of equipment from India, Boeing about a billion dollars. Mm. Airbus has set up its capacity uh, of facility for the C-295 uh, aircraft. Uh, along with that, the uh, Boeing has, uh, the Apache fuselages are made in India today. Uh, the uh, fins of the tail fins of the 737s are made in India. The C-130J Hercules, the big the, yeah. Air Force aircraft, the epinages today are made in India. Uh, Collins Aerospace is here making all the shoots that come out of the aircraft uh, within India, the seat harnesses in India. So slowly, the ecosystem, uh, if you will, is being set up in India as we speak. And that will give a huge boost uh, eventually to the civil aviation sector. More airports that you build, uh, the opposition always points to the fact that uh, Adani gets uh, to manage those airports. Why is that happening every time? See, uh, I don't know. Um, again, I think the uh, opposition has no option but to uh, raise bogies uh, of the uh, close to about 149 airports in India. Uh, a, a particular group has, I think, five or six airports. And those are the that, significant ones. They're not. They're not necessarily the significant. For example, Kolkata is with. Uh, Airports Authority of India, Hyderabad is with GMR, uh, Bangaluru is with Bile, uh, which is Fairfax Holdings, uh, Delhi is with GMR, Jaywar coming up is with Zurich International. Uh, so there are a number of airport players in this country. But when we uh, put out a uh, uh, divestment plan for those particular airports, mm. uh, obviously you're going to be you're going to give it to the highest bidder. Mm. And if you look at the numbers that came out amongst, and each airport, I think, if I'm not mistaken, had close to about four to five bidders hmm. who had bid for it. Uh, but obviously, the Adani group had bid the highest for that particular airport. Uh, and therefore, it went to that particular party. Now, if you told me that don't give it to that party and give it to the second uh, highest bidder, the next controversy would be, why did you give it to the second? So, uh, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Hmm according to the Congress party. Right. Uh, I'm going to just conclude uh, towards it because you have uh, uh, to leave also. I, I really want to know what is it like in the Sindhya household when everybody is discussing politics because people come from d diverse political uh, backgrounds. Some have been MLAs, some have been ministers, some have been chief ministers, some have been uh, MPs. Simple, simple answer. What is it like? Simple answer, we don't discuss politics. No, I don't believe that. We don't. Seriously? At least, at least we try not to. I think it's. I think it's important to. Uh, I'm not going to say that it doesn't come up, mm. but I think it's important to learn about what each other are doing. Mm. Let me take a step back here, and I, and I and I think uh, before I before I tell you about what the environment is like. This is one of the areas where I need to improve. Growing up. My sister and I didn't get to see very much of my father mm -hmm. uh, because he was in politics. He was always on the road. Um, but the time he spent with us was tremendously quality time. Even if it was that 45 minutes in a day only or half an hour in a day. And I think the thing that impacted uh, both of us was the quality of time he gave us. Maybe because it's been a hell of a roller coaster ride for me, or uh, it's this is not an area where I have been able to uh, necessarily be able to give that quality time. Uh, there's always something more on the table that you need to deal with, mm -hmm. and I think this is one of the areas where I need to improve myself and be able to give that quality time. Is cricket a part of oh, yeah. conversation? Absolutely. It is. Absolutely. It's with your son especially. Absolutely. Yeah? Absolutely. Very passionate about it? Very passionate and I, and I think uh, we had a India-Australia match uh, this past week in, in Indore uh, which is my home ground with MPCA and I could only take out an hour and a half but I was there and when I was on the ground I was 
I was a cricketer and I was a I was a fan. Mm-hmm. And my only concentration was on the field, on every single ball. Um, it's 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 a uh, it's a magnet. It, it just it just takes you over. Uh, and I think if you're a if you're a die-hard cricket lover. when the game is on there can there cannot be <laughs> any distractions right. and even if someone walks past you it's like you know yeah. how can you do that you know the, the ball is just being bowled you who know? are your icons who who did you like did you put up posters on your walls or did yeah, you yeah yeah viv richards yeah. and very very early days i i i i remember watching cricket um uh with my father when when we had only black and white TVs mm-hmm. uh, i was a uh, a school boy in bombay and we used to have a little black and white set and we watching gundappa vishwanath and and sunny gavaskar 70s and, yeah so yeah. i'm talking about cricket from those match days. the yeah. Yeah. vankade yeah. stadium and before the one days that. came in yeah, yeah yeah much before yeah. test cricket is test cricket still is still something that you Absolutely. watch you do i am very passionate i am very passionate about the old form of, of the game as well there is there is much to be said about it as there is uh, to be said about the t20 if we didn't have the t20 we would not have ability to perform under pressure and that knack to be able to be fearless uh, gets imbibed from t20 mm. and the level of uh, fitness concentration commitment that our youngsters today are showing is just unbelievable yeah uh, and you know there's so much uh, at in you know they that the access they have to the training to to so much more than the earlier generation i just no, a couple no, no, of let, uh, the, the earlier generation too i i have to say this to you because i have you know i have been uh, witness to cricket in terms of anecdotes from my father's time of the holkar greats to my father's period when he used to be playing in gwalior and mm. indore and all over the place and as a kid i used to play with him at railway stadium when he was railway minister every week every sunday was a cricket match um the commitment was still very much there the concentration on form line and length uh, practice It was was still very tremendous yes there is technology that Techno, has come yeah. to play and there is science that has come to play mm. now uh those elements were not there in those yeah. days but not to say the sportsmen in those days were uh, even uh, iota less committed in fact even more committed it was very natural it was a, it was game. it used to be it used to be a dharm you know uh families and 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 all of that came second Yeah. It it and I'm talking about the days Smita ji when there was no money in cricket. Yeah. There is a lot of money in cricket today. In fact, I would say that there's too much of money in cricket today. I'm talking about the days when you had players going out there and and I'm not kidding you, literally taking a hathoda and keel and you know hammering in those matting wickets mm. uh, before you start play and you start practice, right? Yeah. And and you didn't have the equipment and you didn't have all that exposure but they would be playing day in and day out yeah uh, so so the fervor in in a sport and that dedication again very much uh, like in public service has to come from here hmm that's very important for you isn't it for everything uh, from the heart it is unless it is. you feel a passion you it don't is. do it it is I, and i believe that uh, i i firmly believe that uh your life has to be about that there are many things that we get obsessed with uh while we are on this earth but the we have to realize that at some point of time the the only thing that hopefully you will take away with you is the blessings and the emotions of people that you have been able to touch in your life you know uh, i want to conclude on this one note which i ask many of the guests who come on the podcast is about uh, mental strength and uh, the ability to handle stress you just back from the india china border you were there recently um you know about the you know you you travel so much in your uh, in your line of work uh, how do you, what do you do to keep that level of uh um, to keep yourself centered and manage stress so i i think that's a very good question so there are two types of stress there is a physical element of stress and there is a mental element of stress stress and they are very different for me uh 
managing physical stress has touch wood uh, fortunately never been a concern i do 500 kilometers a day by car or I, i'm touring 14 16 hours a day It's, that's not been an issue and then there is the mental stress uh, and i think for that for the mental stress part of it you need to be able to switch off for my father the switch off was sports so it was cricket and then in his later years golf uh for me the switch off on the one hand is cricket uh and on the other hand uh physical exercise whether it's a workout or whatever else and then reading or music hmm. and i am not regular but it's something that i truly believe in and that's the second thing that i really need to improve on is uh uh i do yoga but not as often as i would want to hmm. uh but i think that there's a great amount of power that comes from yoga uh both physical power and mental power the meditation part as well as the the physical part uh and that's something that i would like to do more so i need to create a little bit of a balance between my workout and and my my yoga um and that's something i hope to work on as well and it's going to be a very busy schedule between madhya pradesh election oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, now, and the now, national now, election and now and now i think till next april may you should forget about everything else and you need to focus are you looking forward at all to the 2024 election oh, as a challenge or as no, something no, which is no absolutely absolutely i believe every election is a challenge mm mm-hmm. uh, and i think you should take it as such whether it's the madhya pradesh assembly election or the lok sabha election and i think it's also uh, uh brings with it a great deal of excitement because you have to go among the people with your with your report card uh and therefore uh, if you've done a, a decent job in the last 5 years then i think you should be welcoming uh, and look forward to that opportunity and therefore i've always believed in in life that uh election does not start the day the model code of conduct comes into place hmm. uh, for me an election starts the day you win an election mm-hmm. and the election ends the day the model code of conduct is announced because that's the period that you should have been working day in and day out right. and if you have done so then you go with a clear conscience to the people to ask asking them for their blessings for another mandate you know stanford has this speaker series uh if you were to address students of stanford and harvard your alumni uh what would you tell them to join politics not join politics and politics in india how is it different from anywhere else i wouldn't i wouldn't summon uh, anyone to to do anything uh, i would i would just say that it's extremely important for you to be doing something in life uh that gets you excited when you wake up in the morning whatever you decide to do in life whatever profession you go in whether you are in media or you are in business or you are in social work or you are in politics it's got to be something that excites you when you wake up in the morning that's number one uh the other thing we always feel in life that we need to be a certain way to be accountable to x or to be a certain way to be accountable to y i always believe that at the end of the day you're accountable to yourself and you need to be able to look at yourself in the mirror before you go to sleep at night and say that i did whatever i could possibly do today and i did it with a clear conscience um and third i've always believed uh, in the principle that always be truthful be loyal uh and if you are truthful and loyal and you work hard there's an old adage that goes that the softest pillow is a clear conscience mm-hmm. and the minute you hit the sack you'll be out on that note thank you so much for being part of the podcast thank you very much and i don't know where time went you 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 just led me from one area to the other so thank you very much for having me thank you thank you so much and thank wishing you. you all the best for madhya pradesh election as well as 2024 thank you very much thank you for watching or listening in to this episode hope you enjoy listening in as much as i liked chatting with jyotiraditya thank you namaste jai hind Click here to watch the previous episodes.